morning, if I can invite you to your chairs and to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. We come to the final half chapter of this book of Ephesians we've been walking through this year. If the beginning of Ephesians goes as far back into eternity as possible, God's plan to choose his people to save them by his grace, and the end of Ephesians goes as broad as possible into a, a cosmic conflict, a cosmic warfare taking place and seeks to identify our role or how we are participants in that warfare. So we're going to look here at this morning verses 10 through 13, although I'm going to read the whole section because we're basically going to take three weeks to examine, meditate, benefit from this section. My Bible titles it the whole armor of God. You may see something similar in your Bibles. That that whole section down to verse 20 is, is one lengthy section. We're going to take three weeks to examine it, just the first three verses this morning. Let's read it together, beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Perhaps one of the most famous magicians in history is the man Houdini. I'm sure you've heard the name Houdini if you've never read about him, quite the interesting life that he had. He basically made a living, made a lifestyle of escaping from seemingly impossible traps, locks, prisons. One trick had him hanging upside down in a large glass tub of water and trying to escape while holding his breath. He, he, he was the, the escape artist magician. He was renowned for this. And one article I read about him talked about the end of his life, somewhat ironic end to the life of Harry Houdini. He said this, the magician, while on tour in Montreal, was relaxing backstage when some college students met him, always proud of his physique. Houdini had often challenged people to punch him with all their strength in the abdomen. He agreed to let one of the students take a punch. But, reclining on a couch at the moment of contact, Houdini had not yet prepared his muscles for the blows. There is speculation, not proven, but speculation, that an injury to the appendix, or perhaps an aggravation of an existing appendicitis or some such difficulty, turned eventually into what would be his death. They don't know if the blow aggravated it. Certainly, at very least, it's ironic that just less than a few weeks later, Houdini died of an attack of peritonitis. He lingered for a few days in the hospital and died October 31st, 1926, on Halloween Day. Ironic that the very area of the body that he was most proud of, he would challenge these students to slug him in the gut, effectively, turned out to be the area which proved his undoing, proved his death, proved something that he could not escape from. So he died, basically, of appendicitis. Fascinating. And as I was reading that story, 
it struck me that Houdini is eerily similar to the Christian that Paul is describing or warning against at the end of Ephesians 6. Paul describes the cosmic struggle that is taking place literally all over the known universe. And he says this is the ultimate reality that the Christian finds himself or herself in. He pictures Christians as being in the midst of a great struggle, in the midst of a, an onslaught, an attack, as it were, a, a fight between God and his enemy, Satan, the devil. And he says Christians are the target of that attack. And he's very concerned that Christians not do what Houdini did and boast in their own strength as being sufficient to ward off this attack. I was struck by Houdini's casualness at these blows. He's reclining on a couch, and I thought, boy, what, a, what an image for Christians who might be tempted to recline, to be casual, to be laid back in the midst of an onslaught. And how ironic that this man who's proud of his strength ultimately succumbs to an infection in a tiny little body part. P.T. O'Brien, the commentator, says, Here, in this section, the apostle looks at the Christian's responsibility of living in the world from a broader, that is, a cosmic perspective. And elsewhere he says, The Christian life as a whole is a profound spiritual warfare of cosmic proportions in which the ultimate opposition, listen to this, the ultimate opposition to advance of the gospel and moral integrity springs from evil, supernatural powers under the control of the God of this world. The Christian life as a whole is a profound spiritual conflict. A profound spiritual conflict. Now, I, I think that this perspective of our life is often foreign to us. I think that we often are more like Houdini, particularly in this culture where persecution of a violent nature is rare. Maybe lounging on a couch, daring an attack, confident that our natural abilities are sufficient, maybe our church history, maybe our disposition, maybe our background, maybe our kind of optimistic personality are sufficient to ward off the sudden onslaught of an enemy. That's what Paul is determined to warn the Ephesians and us against that kind of self-confidence. If I just brace myself, I'll be able to resist this blow. No, Paul says. No, your strength is not enough. In fact, he says it's irrelevant. It's not only insufficient, it's irrelevant. Because this is a spiritual battle. Your natural strength, your natural ability has nothing to do with defense against this particular enemy. Paul urges them that we must seek the power of Christ to guard us from satanic attack. We must seek the power of Christ to guard us from satanic attack. Now he sort of walks through in these first three verses, he sort of walks through four sections. He has a command and then he repeats that command sort of by way of explanation in verse 11. And then he provides the reason why we should obey those commands or the explanation of our enemy. And then finally he gives the goal, the goal there in verse 13 that we would stand. So I'm going to walk through the exhortation, the explanation, the enemy, and the goal. The exhortation, the explanation, the enemy, and the goal. Let's look at the exhortation. This is kind of an overarching exhortation in verse 10 there. If you look down at your Bibles. He says, finally, introduces his final section in this book, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord. It's in the passive voice, which means it's basically receive the strength that the Lord Jesus gives you. Receive, take on the strength given to you by the Lord. And it's a command. So it's one of these odd moments in the Bible where you have a, a passive command. Be strengthened. It's not uh, you uh, strengthen yourself. It's receive the strength that the Lord provides. And he makes it specific when he says, in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He's basically saying that the Christian, in their union with the Lord Jesus Christ, has the ability, the access to the full range of the might of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when a Christian 
turns from sin and turns to Jesus and salvation, they are united with Jesus spiritually in such a way that the full range of his might is now available to the Christian. So he says, be strong, or he might say, be strengthened in the Lord. And what's the scope of that strength? Well, it's the strength of his might. That's the command. Strengthen your soul in Christ, Paul says. Strengthen it. Receive the strength that is yours through your union with Jesus Christ. Receive it. Benefit from it. Cast yourself on it. Receive it as the essential, needful, crucial element of your life. Receive the strength that you have through your union with Jesus Christ. Receive it. Benefit from it. And have no doubt that there's a, a limit because the strength of his might is displayed in his raising from the dead. As he says earlier in the book, the same power is at work in Christians that raised Jesus from the dead. Receive it. That's the exhortation. Receive the strength of the Lord. And it's as though Paul understands that that might be a bit of an ambiguous, how do I, how do, I do that? What does that mean? What do you mean, Paul, be strengthened through my union with Jesus? Well, then he goes to a secondary command that is really kind of an explanation of the first command. He says in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. It's, it's not so much two separate commands as it's one command stated again with a, a metaphor to explain. He's saying to be strengthened in God is to receive what God has given for the defense of the Christian in the face of satanic attack. It's to take up or put on what God has provided, has given you. It's, it's to live in it. It's to function in it. It's to put it on. It's to not have it just as a, a theoretical possession, but as an actual functional day-by-day -day protection. So you can only imagine that the commentators talking about this. Just imagine that Paul's writing from his prison cell, and he sees Roman soldiers traipsing this way and that, perhaps guarding him. And the metaphor comes to mind. Now, there's a little bit of a mystery here. We need, we need to feel this mystery. Obviously, we believe, because Paul says it elsewhere, that ultimately God is the one that preserves his people. God saves us, and God preserves us. But the other side of that mystery is that somehow God's preserving power happens in conjunction with our taking advantage of the protection that he receives. So from our perspective, from our experience, we have to take on the provision that he received. We have to live in it and function in it. It feels as though we have to apply the truths, believe in, function in the truths that he's declared over us in Jesus. That's why this metaphor of, of put on is being used. It doesn't mean that God doesn't ultimately protect his people, but it means, look, in the day-to-day -day life, you have armor, but it's going to feel like you have to put something on. It's not done subconsciously. The Christian life is not lived subconsciously, without any thought or effort. No, you have to, to put on the protection that God has given. It's the armor that God gives. I think sometimes, maybe because of Christian bookstores that sell uh, the Christian armor as a physical, you know, the shield of faith, and you put the helmet of every... Christian has these somewhere in their house, I guess, in this country. And we tend to get almost so distracted by the metaphor that we forget that the metaphor is just a metaphor. It's not as though the shield of faith and the belt of truth are some unusual application of truth. You don't, it's not just faith. You need the shield of faith. No, no. The point is, faith is like a shield. Salvation is like a helmet. Truth is like a belt. The readiness of the gospel, they're like shoes. Don't get distracted by the metaphor as though it's some unique type of, of faith or some unique righteousness. No, it's, it's all the theological gifts that we have in Jesus, but applied functionally as armor to us. Imagine if you were uh, you know, living in the Middle Ages and your dad was a knight who had armor, right? And he would go out and, and fight and guard against his fiefdom and so forth, the enemies that came in. And then one day for Christmas, he gives you a suit of armor because you're growing up and it's time for you to now take your place at his side. And there's going to be a great battle. 
And the enemy is fierce and ferocious and desires your destruction. But instead of taking on the armor that he's given, you leave it at home, confident that you can fight this battle in your own protection. That's exactly what Paul is saying Christians are tempted to do with the promises of God, with the application of the gospel. It's easy to to believe the promises of God as a, a kind of a theological truth and not to function in them from one day to the next. God saved me, I affirm that. But in this moment, this morning, are you putting on, are you meditating in, are you prayerfully remembering, are you accessing emotionally the reality that your salvation is like a helmet to protect you from the onslaught of the enemy? Put on, Paul says, the armor of God. Not subconscious, not done without any attempt. I remember seeing a a humorous um, (laughs) kind of YouTube video talking about the the foolishness of thinking that that Christians can live the Christian life without effort. And it was describing this person that was on the ground, and there's sort of a a drill sergeant person, you know, next to him, and he said, I want you to to do a push-up, but I don't want you to try. And so he got to the ground, and he he starts to push No, you're trying too hard. Just just do it. Just do the push-up. Don't try. He goes, no, too much effort. He tries again. No, 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 it's too much effort. Don't try. Just do the push-up. It's it's foolishness. Sanctification or our pilgrimage is synergistic. That word means that we, we work and God works in us. Salvation is monergistic. That means God does it without any help from us. He saves us. But our pilgrimage, though it's ultimately dependent on the strength of God, We function as though we are taking on, we're applying the reality of God's truth and promises on a day-to-day basis. That's why he says, put on, put on the armor of God. You've been given it. It is wonderfully protective. It's needful, but you have to put it on. And to help them see why this is such a desperate need, he then describes the enemy. Why do we need to be strong in the Lord? Why do we need to put on the whole armor of God? Well, he says, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Lengthy time here spent on describing the enemy of our souls. You need this armor in order that, so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The implication is, without this armor, you can't. And you know, appreciate this, I think, especially as as Western Christians, that um, we don't tend to dismiss spiritualism. And we need to be careful of that. There's shows that are spiritualistic shows. Obviously, right now is a season where there's all kind of spiritualism decorations everywhere uh, in the Home Depot or so forth. You walk in, there's all kinds of evil depictions. And, and, you know, a lot of that's done unintentionally or in fun in that sense. But as Christians, we need to be reminded of something that is a spiritual reality behind that. Evil is real powerful and stronger than us that's paul's point it's real it's powerful and it's stronger than us it's not funny cute or archaic it's real it's powerful and it's stronger than you it's stronger than me paul says there's an enemy and he's scheming that the word implies this kind of devious trickery strategizing the perfect trap for our downfall. One commentator says, mention of the schemes of the devil remind us of the trickery and subterfuge by which evil and temptation present themselves in our lives. Evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. Listen to that. Evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. 
it gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It is baited and camouflaged trap. Schemes of the devil, Paul says. And he's not just scheming. He's not just manipulative. He's not just a deceiver. This is a cosmic array of spiritual powers. You notice there it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is an important change a bit from the Old Testament people of God who did very literally wrestle against flesh and blood. Very literally, they wrestled against people, armies, real armies. But Paul says in the New Covenant, there's been a change. And our wrestling is not with flesh and blood. It doesn't mean our flesh and our blood can't be spilled or destroyed by enemies. It means the ultimate or primary battle that's going on is not a flesh and blood battle. Paul would have been opposed to the Crusades. This is not a flesh and blood battle. This is a spiritual battle. This is not something where strength of arms or some kind of physical stamina gets you through. It's a spiritual battle, and it's a spiritual battle against an array of authorities. Those, those words there, rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, those all seem to be describing the same array of demonic forces. Rulers, authorities, spiritual forces of evil, and the cosmic powers. It's just Paul kind of listing out, look, there's, there's a demonic army that has sway over this world in opposition to God. And it is using every means in its power to defeat the church and to malign the gospel and to undermine the people of God. This is your enemy, Paul says. Authorities, powers, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It means they're not bound to the limitations of a physical existence on earth. They live in the spirit realm and they are able to onslaught against you and me spiritually. This is your enemy. That word wrestle, we do not wrestle. Paul begins to mix his metaphors here. That word can describe any kind of struggle, but it has connotations of hand-to-hand -hand struggling. The idea is the enemy is not just lobbing darts at us from a distance. He is in our face looking to take us down. This struggle can seem very personal, Paul says. You see how Paul's building his case here? Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the armor of God. Why? Well, so that you can stand against the schemes of the enemy, against the spiritual forces of evil, against the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness. We need to think of the Christian life as under attack. We need to think of it as under attack. So let's ask ourselves the question, is our week-by-week -week routine of the Christian life look more like putting on armor against an evil army or more like lounging on a couch, confident that our background and our history will get us through? Imagine the earnestness some of those soldiers are not always struck by, some of those those um, early depictions of warfare, as Paul's referring to here, just the, the I know all warfare is, is brutal, but just the brutality of the hand-to-hand the -hand nature of it. You're in this just chaos of swords flinging back and forth and arrows and can't even see what's coming. If you've ever seen a movie depicting this era of warfare, I think that's what Paul has in mind. And at this point, any, any armor you can have is a good thing to do. Don't wander into a place where there's going to be swords and axes and arrows and darts and maces and everything swinging. You don't just wander in with your flesh and blood. You would put on any amount of armor. You'd be looking for fresh ways to guard fresh areas of the body. That's the vigilance that Paul is urging upon him. He's saying, look, God has 
called you. He saved you. He rescued you from death. He brought you out of the dominion of the evil one. That's chapter two. He brought you into a family. That's chapter three in the church. And he has great purpose for this church to magnify his wisdom before the demons and the angels. He's displaying that he is God and there is no one other. And he can save and reconcile even fallen humanity. But Satan hates this plan. He hates this people. It undermines what he attempted to do in the garden to undermine God. God's original couple. It says that God will have the final word, that Christ will have the final victory, that the covenant people will be restored and God's authority will be demonstrated on the earth rather than forgotten and dismissed as it was with Adam and Eve. And he hates that this is taking place. He hates it that the existence of this church on this Sunday morning with Christians that believe God, are reconciled to God, and are reconciled to each other displays the wisdom of God and the glory of Christ. No, you can almost imagine him saying that. And he's literally hell-bent on undermining and destroying the faith of Christians. And Paul says, this is our existence. Look, brothers and sisters, we wake up every day on a battle day. Every day is a battle day. Some days are more intense than others. He'll talk about an evil day. Certainly, Christians go through times where the battle is more subtle and times when the battle is extreme. If you've ever had an onslaught of depression, you can, you can sense the schemes of the devil where suddenly, for no reason, you find yourself questioning God and the goodness of God and questioning whether you're even saved at all. And this kind of onslaught that comes abruptly and suddenly or the temptation of physical difficulty and suffering as Job experienced, or maybe the temptation that came to Jesus. I'll give you all of this if you just compromise the authority of God. The schemes are perfectly suited to the soul of each Christian. But the onslaught is aggressive. It's powerful. Paul says you have to not just believe and affirm the gospel, you have to function in it. You have to live in, just as you would taking up your armor, functioning in what God has provided in Christ. You have to function in it. The functional application of the gospel is what Paul has in view here. Not just the technical affirmation. It's the functional application on Monday morning when you wake up, Are you functionally thinking about the salvation that God has provided in Christ, the faith that you have in the promises of God, the truth that you can trust in, the the power of the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit? Are Are you living in those realities? We have to consider the strength and power of our enemy and apply our spiritual armor appropriately. O'Brien says many contemporary Christians seem to be unaware that there is a war in progress, or if they are, they consider it to be fought at a purely human level, and therefore earthly resources will be entirely adequate for conducting the campaigns. No, they won't, Paul says. No, they won't. Consider this enemy. Consider his age. Thousands of years he has spent studying human nature. And he has the ability to craft the perfect temptation to undermine the faith of every saint. Consider his resources. The world and its systems are under his sway. He can manipulate culture and world systems to motivate Christians to turn away from the Lord. He can use prosperity or adversity. He can use accusations or accolades. Consider his brazenness. He was willing to tempt the Lord Jesus himself with a full assault on the faith of our Lord. He has no problems addressing himself to our weaker faith. Consider his tactics. He seeks to lie, to call evil good and good evil, and to entice us to doubt the goodness of our Lord and the sufficiency of his gospel. Consider his motives. He hates God, and his whole being is bent on demeaning the nature of God. And he hates that the existence of the church and faith of Christians reveal the power of Jesus Christ. This is the reality Paul seeks to paint for us. 
after walking through all that God has done, the, the, the plan of God, Paul, in his wisdom as inspired by God, he brings us back to Monday morning. Let's look at an eternity past God saved you. And he brought you from death to life. And he linked you with people that you never would have been linked with apart from Jesus Christ. And he has amazing plans, more than you can ask or imagine. And he's called you to live out the gospel and, and, and loving one another and caring one another and, and guarding your speech. And, and also there's, a, there's ways in which you can do this in your roles. Husbands loving their wives and parents raising their children in the Lord and, and workers serving their masters. All your, your life can function in the gospel identity. And now he says, now remember how crucial it is that you put into practice all that I've taught you because you have a great enemy who is determined to destroy you. That's the enemy. Finally, the goal. If you like the E, progress, you call this the end. The end game. The end goal. The goal that Paul has in mind, he says in verse 13, Therefore, in light of all that I've told you, take up the whole armor of God. He repeats that statement again that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Commentators spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the evil day refers to. Most likely, it refers both to the days that we live in, which are evil, but also a, a day of particular difficulty, either for a Christian or for the church in general. I think it probably refers to both of those things. Because all Christians know this, there are certain days where the onslaught of the enemy feels like a particularly evil day. And Paul seems to say, when you've done all your preparation, when you've taken on your armor, when you've considered the truths of the gospel, at the end of the day, you're going to have to stand firm. I've talked to some Christians uh, in just counseling situations, and I, I find this to be a, a needed point, because as, as kind of post-Enlightenment Americans, we tend to think we can think our way through a lot of spiritual difficulties. And we should do that. We should meditate on the gospel. We should prayerfully consider the promises of Jesus. We should be thinking through the power of God's word. But there's also this, at the end of the day, it's just going to be a fight. You can't think your way to such a point that the fight doesn't feel like a fight. Sometimes I found Christians that are just battling depression or discouragement or they, they feel just lost in their Christian life. And they, they find themselves, I, I just want to analyze what's causing this and what's the problem. Is there something in me that I'm so weak that I struggle in this way? Or maybe maybe I'm just not meditating enough. And, and I've wanted to say, and I have said at times, look, there comes a moment where it's not time to analyze. It's time to stand. Analyzing is good. Meditating is good. Evaluating your own heart is good. It's, it's good to do those things. But there comes a moment where it's just standing. It's just declaring. It's just believing. No, it's not true that my sins separate me from God. No, it's not true that, <coughs> that there is a, excuse me, a darkness that I can't reach the, the, through to God and that he can't reach through to me. It, it's, it's not true that God will finally abandon me in the end. It's, it's not true. I resist these thoughts. And often when people are in this kind of spiritual opposition, they find that they just keep coming and coming and coming, and it's hard to resist them. And I, I love that Paul gives this final exhortation. Stand and keep standing. Having done all that you could do, stand. Stand on the promises of God. Stand in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Resist. Fight. Don't turn and run. Don't bow. Stand. Stand immovable. The scheming enemy is not greater than the risen Savior. And it's his strength you are standing in. What does this mean practically for us? Well, I think it means we spend time prayerfully absorbing and applying the truths of God's gospel. If we never spend time putting on our armor, our armor won't be on when the battle comes. Meditate on the goodness of God in Christ so that you can be strengthened 
when Satan questions God's love for you. Meditate on the words of God so that you can be strengthened when Satan throws idols your way. Meditate on the death of Christ so that you can be strengthened when the great accuser throws your guilt in your face. Stand, Paul says, in the strength of the Lord Jesus. Friends, I, th I think we have to be far more concerned when we feel strong than when we feel weak. I find most Christians find it very easy and natural to feel strong, and very uncomfortable to feel weak. But according to this passage, weakness is more realistic to our real condition so that we cast ourselves towards the strength of the Lord. During the Civil War, the Battle of First Manassas in 1861 was going poorly for the Confederates. It's a familiar, familiar story, I'm sure, for many of you. And as the report goes, brigades under Bernard B. and Francis Bartow advanced to another officer's assistance, but even with these reinforcements, the thin gray line collapsed, and Southerners fled in disorder toward Henry Hill. Attempting to rally his men, B used General Thomas J. Jackson's newly arrived brigade as an anchor. Pointing to Jackson, B shouted, There stands Jackson like a stone wall rallying behind the Virginians. Generals Johnston and Burgard then arrived on Henry Hill where they assisted in rallying shattered brigades and redeploying fresh units that were marching to the point of danger. There stands Jackson, like a stone wall. Instead of, of Thomas Jackson, he has uh, such an absolute confidence in the sovereignty of God, he would just stand still while bullets flew around him because he said, if one's supposed to hit me, it will, and no ducking will make any difference. <laughs> If we take this book as a whole, and that opening phrase, be strong in the Lord, don't we have an even better general to look to than they did? Can't we say, look to Christ, standing like a stone wall, like an anchor for our souls? Look at what God has done in saving us in Christ, in raising us in Christ, in building us together into a community in Christ in transforming our daily lives in Christ. And can't we say that in Christ, there is sufficient strength to repulse the attack of the enemy? Yeah, we can. If you're not a Christian, you stand exposed before both the wrath of God and Satan. You have two enemies, and both of them are opposed to you. But if you come to Christ... God makes his offer in such a way that he turns his enmity towards sin into favor. And God saves his enemies. So if you're not a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, it's as though you're saying, I don't want to stand alone towards the wrath of God and the enmity of Satan, the devil. I want to stand with Christ so that I stand secure and protected against both the devil and the just judgment of God on my sin. And if you're a Christian, you can apply this on a daily basis where we go to Christ and say, I will be strong in the Lord. I will remember that he is my sure and steady rock of my salvation. He is the anchor of my soul beyond the veil that will not be shaken. Be strong in the Lord. We could caveat it by saying, there stands Christ. Go to him. And receive the strength that comes from remembering that he is beyond the devil's powers and your own. And all that he has accomplished is sufficient to guard us in the onslaught of the enemy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we delight in you as our rock of strength. We rejoice that you have done all that is needed to guard us from our great enemy. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us a vigilance as a church, 
a prayerfulness, a desire to take up this armor, to apply it, to functionally live in your gospel promises one day to the next. Lord, I pray for tomorrow morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday night that we would be thinking on and living in the armor that you provide, the strength, the guarding strength that we have in you. Lord, and anybody who feels weak or battered from the onslaught of the enemy, I pray you would restore them. I pray you would heal their souls. I pray you would bring them to quiet streams and refresh them. Guard and protect those who are weary in the battle. Give us strength to stand in you. In Jesus' name.